Bob here, Chopper Bob Customs. We're gonna be doing some layout of the wiring on the air conditioner and fan today. Uh, but the first thing I need to do is get some uh, plumbing work taken care of. Uh, the part came in for the overflow tank, so we're gonna go ahead and get it put together right now. Um, I've already got the, um, the end prepped. That was the Carson Top 39 Ford leaving. Uh, but I've already got the end prepped uh, for the um, uh, for the AN fitting, and so we're going to go ahead and get that installed and finish making this line so I can get the, uh, the tank mounted on the car permanently, so it'll be done. Like I said, we've got this 180 degree fitting. It's a little bit closer than I would have liked, but we're going to see if we can't take care of that. Gonna put just a dab of oil on it and go. Okay, so what we've got is a compression fitting adapter. Um, if this was the narrower tank, I probably wouldn't have this issue with this being slightly bent and this kink in the hose right here. The truth of the matter is this is going to be down where you can't see it, uh, at least not clearly, and um, uh, this is just a non-pressure fitting uh, for the overflow on the uh, radiator. The uh, coolant comes in here at the bottom. The bottom is open to this right here, so the coolant will fill up. This tube right here comes all the way up to the top, so if you should ever get the tank completely full, you will have overflow out the bottom here. But this way, when the, um, uh, when the coolant uh, comes in when the car gets hot, then when it cools off, it'll draw it back out, back into the radiator, so you never have any air in the radiator. So I'll go ahead and get this set in the car, and come back and we'll cut the other line to length, and we'll get this permanently installed. The tank is semi-permanently installed. It's installed at the highest point. Well, it could actually come up a little bit higher, but I'd have to undo the brackets on the radiator. So right now it's at the highest point that the brackets on the radiator allow it to go. And that's so if I develop any slack when I make this part, I can let it drop down a little bit to make this a nice clean appearing part. Um, and uh, the other thing about this is I've actually, I'm using the um, tube guide that comes on the radiator and it's fixed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all this off, go over to the workbench and put the end on, and then come back over, well, I take that back, I'm not going to put the end in, I'm going to take the, it over and cut it at the bench, and then I'm going to come back over here, slide it up through that, and install the hose end on the car. Now, eventually, if he ever has to take this apart, he can pry that uh, aluminum bracket back out of the way. It's just that I don't want to do a lot of bending of that aluminum bracket if I don't have to, and I can assemble this end on the car. So let me take a mark here. I'm going to try and get as close as I possibly can to making this nice and tight. 
since it won't be seen I am going to go ahead and put a sharpie mark on it at the approximate location of the land inside the uh, the nut of the AN fitting and then I'm going to take it all back off and take it over the bench and cut it so I'll be right back as much as I did not want to bend that clamp on the side of the radiator building the hot rod means you need to be able to change your plans and in order to get this hose end assembled I had to take it over to the vise um, I think this particular brand of end is a little bit harder to get the hose in than the brand that the 180 is and so I really struggled to get it on even at the vise so but I got the hose end on there did not move so I didn't have to worry about the 16th of an inch sliding it out works so much better on the vise so to recap what we got here to get the 1 16th NPT on the radiator neck, I went with an NOS nitrous oxide fitting uh, that's 1 16th NPT on one end and dash 4 AN on the other, an AN straight fitting, uh, number 4 AN braided stainless steel line, a 180 degree AN fitting on the bottom, and then a compression fitting on the tube that goes to AN uh, flare. So this is all installed nice and solid. <clears throat> the chances of this thing actually overflowing are pretty slim based on my experience. So I haven't put a hose on this. I just have the, uh, the outlet just pointing straight down at the uh, steering box. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue. So for right now, I'm not going to put a hose on it. If the owner sees that he's getting uh, fluid out of that, We'll probably go ahead and put a small hose on it and route it through the lower clamp that's built onto the radiator but right now I don't see a need for it. So with that uh, let's go uh, look at some wiring. The wiring on this car some of it was good some of it is just sort of a hodgepodge of stuff. I, I've got wires that terminate in uh, black plastic uh, tape I've got this connection that I'm not exactly sure where it goes. Uh, I'm going to have to figure out where all these wires go. But right now my concern is to get the air conditioning and the heater, or I'm sorry, the air conditioning and the uh, electric fan on the radiator hooked up. And so what we're going to have coming through this panel on the um, uh, firewall that I cleaned up the other day, I've got them temporarily run through the heater hose uh, hole. Uh, the grommets for the heater hose are supposed to be here tomorrow um, so those holes will be taken care of shortly and then I'll be showing you here shortly what we're going to do with these wires but basically what we've got coming for the air conditioner and the fan are uh, five wires we've got these wires right here these three wires right here that have the crimped on terminals they go into this um, I don't know whether it's a Metropac or some other type. It's Ismark Delphi, so it is an American design. And this clips onto the heater control valve that goes on the heater hose. And these snap into it, and they're held in place with this retainer. Um, and so we've got those wires coming out of the uh, air conditioning unit. And then we've got this blue wire that's about a mile long. Uh, and that is what was hooked up to the compressor so that the air conditioning unit inside the car told the compressor to come on. Um, I don't know what safety equipment there is uh, to prevent damage to the air conditioning unit on the inside and I can tell you for a fact if this is hooked up directly to the compressor there's no um, there's no safety equipment on the compressor so we're gonna fix that and we're also gonna shorten it because originally the air conditioning compressor was on the driver's side the left side of the car and now the air conditioning compressor is on the right side the passenger side of the car so we're going to address that and then the other wire that we've got coming out is from the EFI unit uh, the FITEC the yellow wire controls the fan and the temperature sensing unit that's with the FITEC unit not only uh, tells the computer what to do as far as fuel mixture uh, to accommodate the different engine temperatures but it also uh, reads the temperature that you can display on a screen inside the car 
and then it also has a control for the fan so you can set temperatures where you want the radiator fan to come on and where you want the radiator fan to go off and that's all controlled with the control panel that has the screen on it so you can see the temperature it'll show you when the fan comes on it'll show you when the fan goes off according to the instructions this is the ground for the relay and I'll get into that here shortly uh, so th this will need to hook up to the ground and then we'll talk about the relays and the protection that we're going to put into the car when I sit down at the bench and go over the parts and pieces that we're going to put in this. This is a little bit of what's going to go into the wiring on this car, particularly in the HVAC unit and the radiator cooling fan. Uh, when they had installed the fan originally, they had hardwired it in. So to get the fan out of the car, I had to cut the wires. Uh, one of the things I'll be doing is using a quick connect on the uh, so that any future servicing of the fan can be taken care of rather easily. Uh, I will either be using a weather pack or a metro pack connection. As the name weather pack implies, it is weatherproof. Um, it's got this rubber seal right here that when you plug them together, it keeps the environment out of the contacts. And then at the ends where the wires go in it has these little rubber seals I don't know whether you can see that or not that basically go in the end and seal that so when you put them all together it's completely weather sealed protecting it from corrosion from the environment now the weather packs are smaller than uh, other ones um, the problem with that is they're rated I think they're rated at like 14 or 15 amps I'm going to have to check and see what they're actually rated at, and I'm also going to have to check and see the amp draw of this fan to see whether this is sufficient or not. If it's not, I'm going to go to the next bump up, which is a metric pack, which is also weatherproof, but it is a more robust unit, has a higher amperage rating, but as you can see, it is, no, I just dropped that one on the floor, it is slightly bulkier than the, than the weather pack. So, we're going to be doing that. Now, what's going to control the fan and what's going to control the compressor ultimately will be relays. Now, what a relay does is it allows you to use a low amperage signal to allow a high amperage current flow to the device you want to run. And basically what happens is these two outer terminals right here, one of them uh, is a is a ground and one of them is hot and when you make the hot hot or the ground ground depending on what your circuit is like and I'll get to that in a minute but as long as this is hot and this is this is a ground what happens is it energizes the coil in the relay and what the coil does is it moves a set of points now this happens to be a single pole which means it has one power inlet but it's a double throw which means that it has two power outlets Okay, and basically 87A, which is the middle one right here, that one is normally closed. So if there's no power going to the coil, if there's no ground or there's no power going to it, then the coil is not energized and the points are in the normally closed position, which means this terminal right here is connected to right here. So you can use this to turn things off by having it hooked here and here normally and then whenever the switching mechanism makes the connection here to engage the coil on the inside of this it breaks the contact of this and this one right here goes dead now the opposite is this one right here this one is normally open this is the 87 connection at the very end and it's normally open so when there's no controlling power going to the relay this one right here is has no power going to it but when you energize the coil by having a ground and a power supply and these are interchangeable this can be the power supply and this can be the ground when you energize it it makes the connection from this terminal right here to this terminal right here which allows you to turn on the item that you want to turn on and unlike the switches which sometimes are good for depends on the switch sometimes they're good for an amp sometimes they're good for five amps uh, sometimes if it's an electronic switch, it may not even be good enough for one amp. And so you really need something to be able to turn it on 
high amperage. This particular relay is rated at 40 amps at 14 volts. So you can use this to power a fairly heavy piece of equipment with a control unit that doesn't have a whole lot of power output. So now, with that said, I've also got to address the fact that this does have a coil in it. And when you energize it, it makes the points move. When you de-energize it, take the power away from it, the points go back to the normally closed position. And what happens is that coil, the electromagnetic field in it, will collapse. And when that happens, it will induce a reverse voltage into uh, these terminals right here. Now usually that's not a problem on an older car where you've got incandescent bulbs and you don't have electronics. But when you're dealing with cars that have electronics or LED bulbs, uh, for that matter, I think I blew out a temperature sending unit on my fan because that coil collapsed and caused a back voltage into the controller for the fan. And I think it fried my controller for the fan. Um, so what you want to do is you want to put what's called a flyback diode in the system. Now, there are some relays that come already equipped with a flyback diode in them. And uh, you will see, you'll be able to tell that because it will have a little picture of a schematic representation of a diode. As seen here. Now, those tend to be a little on the pricey side and sometimes they're hard to find. These right here, you can find all day long and uh, they're very robust uh, because they do sell a lot of them. The price is really attractive, but you still have that problem with the flyback. Well, what you can do is you can get a diode and install it yourself. Now, these are fairly robust. Uh, they're rated at one amp at uh, 100 volts. So some electronic equipment, you have to be very careful with static electricity. Uh, one amp diode, probably not so much, but still it's a good idea to use good practice and keep them in a static free bag and keep them isolated from each other. But these are the diodes I'll be using on this. I'll be using three of them. And if you see, there is a little white stripe, or gray stripe, silver stripe right there. That is the side that goes towards the positive terminal. So whichever terminal on your diode uh, is going to be the hot or the positive from the battery, that's the one where that stripe goes, and then the other one goes to the ground or the negative. I'm going to use common, ground, and I'm going to use hot and positive all interchangeably, and I'm going to use common, ground, and negative interchangeably. If you guys have a positive ground car, I hope you understand that you need to be thinking backwards on a lot of the stuff that I say, unless I specifically say positive and negative. But what we're dealing with here is a negative ground car, and so when I say ground or common, that's the negative, that's the ground. And if I say hot, that's the 12 volt or the power supply uh, that I'll sometimes say. So what I'll be doing is I'll be using these relay sockets and I'll be installing that flyback diode between these two terminals right here. Now right now they're black and white and what I do is I replace these uh, pigtails and I wire them direct so that I don't have a bunch of uh, crimp connectors and shrink tube and, and everything else it, it ends up looking more like a factory installation and what I have is I've actually found the source and I'm going to put the part numbers and the uh, it, it's Mouser Electronics uh, I don't get a dime from them but uh, they have got just it takes me hours to go through they've got so much stuff to find what, they're, what they've got that I can use for hot rods. It's not funny. They have these terminals, which have the little tang in them that locks them into the relay socket. And then they also have not only the crimp area for the wire, for the uninsulated part of the wire, they also have the crimp area that locks the insulated part of the wire into this terminal, making it a very robust fitting. 
and these things are, are dirt cheap and so as you can see I keep a bag of them handy so that I can do these relay wirings with this. Now beyond that the way I'm going to wire this up one of the things that I have is the Phytech instructions and I've got other instructions that tells me what I'm going to do. But the blue wire that I showed you coming through the firewall is going to go to a relay. And it is a hot supply, so this relay, the other side will be grounded, negative, and so that will energize this relay. This terminal right here will be going directly to the positive side of the battery, and this will be going to the compressor. No, I take that back. Well, no, this will be going directly to the compressor. Now, so when this supply comes in hot, assuming this is the one, no, it'll probably be this one, that's closest to the firewall. This one comes in hot. If this one is grounded, then it'll energize the coil and finish the circuit and power up the, the uh, compressor. Now, the reason I say if this one is negative is that this negative line is going to have another switch in it and that is going to be a trinary switch. Now what the trinary switch does, in this case, it's got four wires coming through. And the black goes to the black and the blue goes to the blue. So let's talk about the black wires first. The black wires are the Goldilocks of the trinary switch. Now this mounts on the air conditioning receiver dehydrator and it senses the pressure in the high pressure line. So the Goldilocks ones here, if the pressure is too low, the switch does not make the connection between this wire and this wire. So there's no ground going to the relay, so the relay does not energize. Now, in a similar fashion, if the high side pressure gets too high, it turns the switch off, so there's no connection between these two wires which means there's no connection to the relay, there's no ground to the relay, which means the relay is not turned on, which means that there's no power going to the compressor. The reason that happens is, if the pressure is too low, that means you're low on Freon. And the Freon is what helps the lubricating oil go through the system and keep the compressor lubricated. And if you don't have the Freon in there, there's a good chance that the compressor is not going to be lubricated correctly and you're going to damage the compressor. And so if the pressure is low, you don't want to ground here because you do not want the compressor to come on. Similarly, if the pressure gets too high, the compressor is pumping that Freon through the system. And if the pressure is too high, that is making the pump, the compressor, work extra hard and can damage the compressor from basically putting too much of a load on it. And so you want to be able to turn the compressor off if the high side pressure gets too high. So that's what happens here. If the pressure's too low, there's no connection. If the pressure's too high, there's no, no connection. If the pressure is just right, these two make connections and will create a ground for your relay. So you have to have the pressure just right on your Goldilocks connection, and you have to have a signal from a hot signal coming from the HVAC unit going here in order to make the connection between the battery and the compressor. So that's going to control the compressor. Now, there's another set of wires on here, the blues. Now what the blues do are is that at a preset pressure, when it reaches that, the blue wires are connected together. Now we're going to use this as a ground as well. One of them is going to be grounded. One of them is going to go to a relay. And that relay is going to be for the fan control. So what's going to happen with this relay is the battery is going to come to the supply side. It's also going to come to this side over here. And that way when the trinary, the blue wires ground, the unit, it engages it and makes the connection between here and the fan, between the battery and the fan, and turns the fan on. The reason for that is, is that a lot of times high pressure is because you're not pulling enough heat away from 
the Freon in the condenser mounted out in front of the radiator. And so if it reaches that pressure where this says, hey, you need to add some airflow to that condenser, and the engine temperature is not up to the point where the electric fan is running, this will turn on the electric fan and cause it to run and cool the, the condenser down and hopefully get that high side pressure down so then this will turn back off because it will lose its ground at the trinary switch. Okay? So that's what we're going to use the second relay. And then the final relay is going to be the fan control based on the engine temperature. And here again, what's going to happen is the battery is going to be connected to this terminal right here, and the battery is going to be connected to this terminal right here. And the Phytech fan control wire is going to be connected to this, wire, this terminal right here. So when the Phytech tells the fan to come on, this will ground, it will already have hot to it, it will energize it, and the connection will be made between this terminal at the battery and this terminal at the fan. And this sort of gets to another reason why relays are very valuable for this type of work. Because let's just say you had the Phytech controlling the fan directly and you had the, um, the relay set up so that the uh, the, the trinary switch controlled the fan and the compressor. Well, what could happen would be is if the, if the trinary switch determines that the fan needs to come on, it turns the fan on, but that would also connect up to the Phytech, and it would send an electric current to the Phytech, which could be enough to damage components in the Phytech. It could be going the wrong direction, which would damage components in the Phytech, you just basically don't, you want to segregate your control systems from the items that are being controlled. And so in this case, what's going to happen is, both of these terminals are going to be connected to the battery positive terminal, and both of these connections are going to be connected to the positive terminal of the fan. One of these will turn on when the uh, trinary switch energizes it, and, one of, and the other one will be turned on when the Phytech energizes it. But because the energizing, energizing systems are separate, the Phytech won't know that the trinary switch has energized the fan. And likewise, the trinary switch will never know that the Phytech has energized the fan because the fan energization is coming from the battery terminals here and so both of these are connected to the battery so those are essentially the same and it's connected to the fan here so these are essentially the same and the only difference is whether or not the point inside is making contact and if both of them are energized it's just a double pathway from the battery to the fan and if neither of them are energized there's no pathway between the battery and the fan. So, Relays have been around for ages. They're, like I said, they're robust. There are electronic alternatives to it, but as far as expense and robustness, you can't beat these. And in a minute, I'll show you how I go ahead and wire them. I think I forgot to mention this. Uh, this is a weathertight gland nut, and it acts as a strain relief. And so what I'll be doing, when I said that I was gonna bring the wires through the firewall and protect them. Uh, this right here is what will be going through a hole in the in the firewall. Actually, it'll probably be in that panel that I cleaned up the other day. And what this is, it's got a EPDM rubber seal right here, and it goes through the hole in the firewall, or in this case, the plate on the firewall, and the nut goes on the back side and you tighten that up and lock the unit in place. And then this nut right here, if you look in behind it, it has a slotted member with a EPDM, I'm sure, rubber seal on it as well. And when you run the wires through this and tighten this nut down, what it does is, is it closes that rubber seal around the wire. And these come in different sizes. 
Um, and they just make a really clean installation. Uh, you don't have to worry about the grommets not sealing correctly. Uh, I use these on wire connections running through the firewall or through the floor anytime that I can because they do a great job of protecting the wire and they do a great job of sealing out the environment so you're not getting water and mud and dirt and mud daubers in your car through this. I'm going to go ahead and put together uh, an end on the fan here. Uh, I've determined that these are 12 gauge wires um, and so what I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and use the metric pack on them um, just to be on the safe side even if this fan does not draw the amperage that a metric pack is good for this way um, if he should ever put a higher amperage fan on the car uh, he'll be covered and so uh, now, uh, usually what I like to do is I like to put the small unit on the device that you're going to be taking off and putting back on. Just because it is less likely to put a strain on the part. <clears throat> and so what I need to do is I need to pick out the set of number 12s for this connector. set of number 12 seals. And you slide the seal on the insulation and you make sure that you've stripped off enough material that you're going to make a good connection with the wire but then that you will also be grabbing the insulation with the crimp for it, capturing the seal. Now, I do have a crimp tool for this particular type of product, but it only goes up to 16 gauge. And so for the larger crimps, I do use this tool, which I've modified a little bit to make the dies work with this particular type of connector. And so what I'll do is I will get it loaded up into the tool. And then I will slide the wire and the insulator in, making sure that the insulator is all the way in to the crimp connector and that the wire is properly positioned. And then I will go ahead and run the crimp. see what I've done. Okay, there it's a little bit fuzzy, isn't it? So I've got the crimp on the wire and I've got the crimp on the uh, insulator of the uh, weather seal. So I'll go ahead and do the other one. And these
usually like to make the positive one an A. So I'm going to make the assumption that the red wire is the positive one and it will slide into the A cavity and snap. and they tend to be just a little bit thin. Here, that one snapped. And let's see if I can get this one to line up. It's like pushing a rope. tool sometimes is, is it kicks the side out just a wee little bit and what you have to do is kind of massage it so that the fitting is not too wide to go through the hole. Make sure that you still have a good crimp. clicks and when they're clear out there at the end like that you know you've got a good connection and then you put your lock on and the lock goes between the wires like that slides forward like that and locks in place and now the wires cannot be pulled out both from this and from the little clips on the inside here so we've got that connected now I'm also going to go ahead and put a connector on the trinary switch but what I'm going to use on it is a weather pack because it is a lightweight unit and for it I'm going to use the four square and I'm going to do the same thing with it but these wires These wires appear to be 16s. For that I get two 16 or four 16 connectors. And four 16 seals. Which drop on the floor quite readily. Let me zoom this out just a little bit. Okay, so now for this, I believe we can use this tool right here. We slide the connector into the 14 to 16 gauge connector. We slide the 16 gauge seal, which is actually a little loose. I think I'm going to go ahead and use the smaller seal on this. Place. Slide this in, making sure that the wire is positioned correctly in the crimp area. And then we crimp it home. And it should pull out. It should. Crimp and a 
good grasp on the seal. And we'll just do that four times, three more times. And usually I like to run the uh, compressor in the A and the B cavity. All I gotta do is be able to see which one's A and B. There's the A and the B. So I will run the compressor into the A and the B cavities. Sometimes you gotta a little get get a little bit creative when you're doing these, and um, let's go ahead and give each one of these just a little bit of a tweak. Okay, try this again. A. Push it until it clicks. B. Push it until it clicks. C. And then the lock on the weather pack is integral with the part, so you just simply roll this over, making sure that you capture the wires on the correct side, and click it till it locks, and there you've got that. Now, the thing about this is this is a switch. It's out there in a harsh environment. If it goes bad, uh, it's nice to be able to just uh, pop this off you can take this off of the um, off of the terminals, crimp uh, new terminals and new seals on the, the new wires for the new trinary switch, pop them back into this cavity, and then you can plug them back into the car. So there's that. So uh, with that, uh, my phone's ringing. Um, we're going to say, uh, please subscribe. Please set your notifications, please like and comment, and for now, Chopper Bob out.